Tired of lying awake, tossing and turning, just hoping for a few hours of sleep? Get the sleep you crave with the one-of-a-kind Tempur-Pedic. Only Tempur-Pedic uses proprietary temper material that continuously adapts and responds to your body to relieve pressure, so you get deep, uninterrupted sleep all night, every night. The Tempur-Pedic Summer of Sleep starts now with all Tempur-Pedic mattresses on sale and savings up to $500 on adjustable sets. Learn more at TempurPedic.com. At Capella University, you're in control of your education. With the game-changing FlexPath format, you can set your own deadlines and move at your own pace. The faster you move, the more you save. Visit capella.edu to learn more. And then after that, I had to carry all, all the equipment across the volcano and, and traverse to find, well, to get to the, the route uh, that I had climbed up to, so I could go back down and get back to, the, to my car. So that was uh, not, not a, really a hike and fly. It was like a hike and fly and then hike some more. <laughs> Hey folks, hope you're having a good week. I hope you're getting, you're getting ready for some adventure this weekend. Uh, if not, I'm, I'm not really doing anything this weekend. I had a very busy last weekend doing a, a, one of our 24-hour adventures. I started doing one 24-hour experience where it's like, you know, you leave on Friday, you do an adventure, uh, you know, you camp Friday night, you get to where you're going Friday, do the adventure, and then you're back Saturday night so that I'm only away from the family for, uh, you know, 24 hours total. So they only have to go through, you know, w- one meal, one time going to bed together without me. Um, and that's something I, I'm starting to do just to be able to fit adventure in. And I do that every eight weeks with my friends. And what's cool about that is, you know, it's not it's not so infrequent that it it's 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 you know too spread out like once a quarter but it's not so frequent like once a month that it just you know you start having to skip months because you know weekends just fill up when you have kids or you got you know busy life so once every two months we found a good cadence that gives us six 24-hour trips a year and not including all the little things we do in between or the the evening stuff or uh, just something else that randomly pops up. It feels like a lot more than it is. And and you'd be absolutely amazed what you can fit into a 24-hour experience, especially if maybe one of those turns into a 48-hour or um, you know a 30-hour experience. You can fit so much adventure into that amount of time. And someone who's really doing that to the nth degree is Adrian Garza here. Adrian was on the show a few years ago. This is a throwback. But this this guy is unbelievable. He takes it to a whole different level. He will climb to the top of 18,000-foot volcanoes and literally paraglide off the top. One, because it's really freaking awesome to do that. Two, it's a heck of a lot faster than down climbing. Um, you know, climbing up a mountain takes enough time, but he can jump off the top and be down in minutes, be back to his car, driving back home to Mexico City in no time, and he sleeps in a hypoxic chamber at night to help acclimate for those for those really extreme pushes in those 24-hour experiences. And by the way, yeah, he's doing all this stuff in a day. He'll leave work, drive up to, you know, a trailhead, hike up to 18,000 feet and jump off the top, drive back, you know, hike back to his car, drive home. He's only gone from his young family for 24 hours. It's pretty incredible. And also, if you don't know, Mexico City is like at 70-something hundred feet. It's a really high elevation city, uh, so it, he definitely has that advantage there. But he's just taken the micro-adventure, at least in a short amount of time, to a whole new level, which is really cool. So I remember this being one of my favorite episodes, so I, I hope you enjoy as well. Uh, and we don't have a sponsor today, but I did want to shout out, we've had a couple new Patreon supporters lately, and I want to say thank you so much. You you support the show through five bucks a month, uh, or a dollar a month, or two dollars a month, whatever you choose. Uh, but there are some supporters on there that have just been with us a long time. I want to say thank you so much. Uh, we're working on getting just more more exclusive stuff on there, some merch, some some more stickers, stuff like that. Um, and, but we also have the ability if you want to, you know, if you don't want to support monthly, but you want to make a one-time donation, there's a link for that in the show notes too. Every little bit helps. You know, I do this on nights and weekends. I do this around time with family, uh, but I love it. I love talking to y'all or talking to the guests. And I love having this, uh, for folks that are out on adventures. We hear from a lot of people who are 
out on an adventure somewhere, whether they're biking across the Sahara or walking across a frozen lake somewhere, or they're just traveling around the world, or they're just out for the weekend. We hear from a lot of people who are on the adventure. Uh, So thank you. Thank you for listening. And yeah, enjoy today's episode. Adrian, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Mason. Glad to be here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you just got off works. Thanks for joining us. Um, why don't you just explain, like, what is this sport that you do? Because I don't think a lot of people are familiar with it. Yeah, of course. Um, so my background is uh, more in uh, rock climbing first and then mm. and then uh, high altitude mountaineering. Um, around Mexico City, we have volcanoes that, that are, you know, over 15,000 feet. Uh, so it's a, a pretty good uh, athletic challenge just to just to hike up there, even with a lead pack on. And then uh, one day, you know, I had seen this this documentary about uh, Cedar Wright, who was a, a climber, doing this this uh, paragliding flight off the summit of of the tallest mountain in Mexico. It's a volcano called Pico de Orizaba. And at that point, he was uh, still uh, a beginner in, in terms of paragliding, even though he was a pro climber for many years. And I'd been on that volcano before uh, several times. And, and that idea kind of uh, was, you know, stuck in, in, in the back of my mind. And then one day my wife came back from a, a trip to Peru and she went on a tandem flight in, in Lima. And she loved it and she wanted to explore paragliding and learning together. So I thought, you know, it would be great if I could combine uh, what I'm already doing, which is uh, hiking up these these high volcanoes, and then uh, flying from from the summit. And and that's what I I set out to do when I started taking lessons along with her. Holy cow! Now I'm looking the the mountain you just mentioned is eighteen thousand, almost eighteen thousand five hundred feet. <clears throat> exactly. Yes. And you just and you haven't been doing this very long. I have not. Um, so we we started taking lessons in. May 2017, and then I got my license in January of 2018, last year, a little over a year ago. Um, and in order to get a license to to be able to fly um, by yourself away from your home site, you have to have at least 30 flights. Uh, and and there's a practical exam and a theoretical exam, and and of course the actual lessons. So my my flight number 31 was uh, a hike and fly from from one of these uh, volcanoes here in, in in Mexico, which is another one called, uh, it's a complicated name, it's called Iztaccíhuatl, so they call him Ista for short, and it's uh, a little more over 17,000 feet. It's also pretty high. It's the third highest in Mexico. <laughs> Man, that is crazy. It's like it's like <laughs> you get your driver's license and you jump straight into like <laughs> Formula One racing. <laughs> Like you got your license and just, just took off. Like holy cow, that's crazy, man. So your wife got you into this. Now does yeah. she still do this with you, or, or have you kind of done it on your own? She hasn't been doing it because we recently had a baby. Oh, congratulations! Uh, so we, thank you, thank you. We have a it's almost three months old now. Boy or girl? A yeah, girl. All right, a baby girl. Congrats. Yeah, I, I've got one on the way in a couple months. So oh, congratulations. first time. So yeah, yeah. You'll, I'll have to get some tips from you, man. Cause <laughs> I'm scared to death. I won't have time to do anything anymore. Yeah. That's, that's scarier than flying off a volcano for sure. <laughs> the first kid. <laughs> mm. That's funny. <laughs> Dang man. So, so she's taking a break cause uh, y'all had, a, y'all had a baby girl and, uh, but you're still doing it. Yeah. I uh, still have found a way to, to keep doing it. My, my last hike and fly trip was, uh, late November last year, and that was on uh, another kind of subsidiary summit of Ista in a more remote part of the volcano, which is not as frequented as uh, the normal route to the, the primary summit. Right, right. It, it's a place that's more remote, and when I was there, there was I was the only person uh, around. But the interesting thing for me about that trip was that I could manage to do it in a single day as a round trip uh, from Mexico City uh, there and back without having to spend the night uh, uh, on the mountain. So, you know, being a, a, a new father and still adapting to to all this, it was a lot easier for me to, well, to to find a place where I could go out and come back the same day. 
Did, did you go to work the next day? <laughs> I did it on a Saturday, so I got out okay. of the day to, to recover. So people ask you what you did that weekend. You're like, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think my, my colleagues are a little used to it uh, by now. But at first, it was uh, quite surprising. Man, I can't believe it. I, I bet they think you're crazy. <laughs> yeah, so it, it can look like that from, from the outside. Um, but I'm, I'm actually... Uh, very cautious and uh that's something that uh, my, my wife and, and my mom are, are very grateful for and they, they come to understand that so they 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 rest a little easier now that got them to know how i approach these things so so how what do you what do you look for when you go up a mountain is it do you do your research beforehand and, and what kind of things do you have to watch out for yeah uh, yeah i try to 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 be as familiar as i can with the actual place so all, all of these volcanoes that I've flown from are places that I've previously climbed at least once, and, and most of them are more than once, up to 10 or more times. I think uh, for me, I mean, unless you're going with a guide, you know, on a guided uh, hike and fly trip, I think it's first and foremost, you have to be comfortable being on the mountain and being uh, up on a high mountain and, and being up high on that specific mountain and carrying a, a heavy backpack. Oh, um, so, so I tried to add as, as few uh, new variables to the equation at a time as possible. Uh, so for example, I would recommend somebody do this and, and be their first time at high, high elevation and also the first time on that mountain and also their first time carrying a big backpack and also their first time <clears throat> flying alone, etc. So I tried to gradually add all of those new variables, uh, you know, one at a time if possible um so that when it comes time to to actually hike up and fly off uh, you're already familiar and comfortable with with most of the the, the aspects of, of what you're going to do my goodness man that is so crazy that is so cool though that is <laughs> amazing like what a cool idea now are you do you know anyone else doing this that like, can you go with or are you kind of just alone in your community in your network there, there are people that have done this as well, um, and I actually talked to some of the people that that flew off of Ista, you know, to to get uh, some right. data from them to get information about how they approached it and where they took off. And the, there's also a, a platform where people can upload their flights, their paragliding flights. So the the flights from Ista from this team uh, are on there. Uh, Cedar Wright's flight from Orizaba is on there as well, so you can actually look at the track. So, and and I've seen you know other videos of other people doing this. I know, of, I mean, for sure that from Ista and Orizaba, other people have flown. But then some of the other ones that I've flown from, uh, I don't know of anyone else that that has flown from from those places. So at least two of the volcanoes that I've flown from, uh, they're possibly the I've, I've done possibly the first uh, flight from those. Wow. It's at least the first documented flight. And and now to get back to the question, there there aren't that many people that do this. And I think, well, the first reason is there aren't really that many paraglider pilots in Mexico to begin with. I mean, it's a country of like 125 million people. And there's maybe, I mean, someone told me once that around maybe 500 pilots. Maybe by now, that was like two years ago, maybe there's more than that. But I'm pretty sure it's less than a thousand pilots in the whole country. Wow. And then of those pilots, the people that are actually interested in, in, you know, in climbing up to 18,000 feet, probably a, a really small fraction of those. And then also to do this, it helps a lot if you have uh, equipment that's, that's lighter than, than the regular equipment so that you can actually carry it all the way up. You also probably need to have, you know, dedicated hike and fly equipment. Uh, so there's harnesses that are made uh, for that that are lighter with you know different kinds of materials, and the wings themselves uh, also um, they're becoming more and more popular and they're made from you know a slightly uh, lighter cloth and and they have different materials on on the webbing that that attaches to the harness and and stuff like that. So it's uh, unless somebody has kind of like the specific idea of, of getting into it, kind of like I did. So I chose my equipment. To, to be uh, functional for that kind of stuff. Mm. Uh, it's going to be hard to, to find someone that that would be uh, capable and, and willing and and has the right equipment to do it. So there's, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's part of what, what, what really attracts me to it here is that it's so few people doing it and so few people doing it here that 
there's a lot of things to be done that that nobody's ever done before so you you actually feel like like you really are on an adventure right you're exploring and doing things that that haven't been done before and there's no no real reference that you can go to to just copy and then replicate yeah it's pretty seems like a pretty niche sport and the way you're doing it is just definitely you're gonna be one of the only ones but in that same time you're setting a lot of records doing a lot of first descents and uh wow it's just amazing so so when you're going up what what so like your day-to-day trip what, what kind of gear do you have to place? How much food, how much water, and how long are you in the air? Like, what are you, what are you different from like a day hiker that's on the same mountain? Sure. Like, for example, on Ista, a typical trip to, to, to go and summit a volcano would involve at least uh, two nights at base camp or one night at base camp and then one night on a higher camp, uh, especially for people that are coming from from uh, lower altitudes yeah because um, in mexico city i already have an advantage because i'm in here and in my home i'm already at like seven thousand feet elevation so Dang. i mean that's higher than denver and, and almost as high as like aspen snow mass <laughs> you're, yeah you're i live at six and uh yeah you're a thousand feet higher than me dang yeah yeah so some people even you know get altitude sickness uh, just coming to mexico city right so so there I have already an advantage. But if you're not coming from here, uh, you would fly into Mexico City and, and spend the night here, ideally. And then the next day, make it out to base camp, which is, is like almost 13,000 feet. And you can get there by car. It's pretty accessible. So it's a lot of elevation gain in, in one day, uh, going from 7,000 to 13,000. And then the next day, people usually just take it easy so their body acclimatizes maybe do a short hike and then and maybe the following night start their summit bit uh and it's like an, an alpine start at like maybe 2 a.m 3 a.m really early in the morning and they'll usually take a like a really light backpack because you, you can do it you can do your summit bit all the way f- down from base camp in a single day and back and they'll probably take maybe depending on on the speed of the group but like let's say five hours to get to the summit to spend an hour there and then maybe three hours, four hours to come back. So it's around a 10-hour day on, on the mountain at altitude. So it's like a three-day trip almost. And they'll usually take a light pack, so maybe like around maybe two liters of water. And all in all with, you know, the crampons and the ice axe, you know, the extra clothing and your snacks and, and whatnot, it probably you know, less than, less than 12 pounds of equipment, less than 10 pounds. So you go as, as light as possible. Um, and if, if you want to do a hike and fly that you'll probably have to take more than twice as much gear and, and, and weight. So my gear with, you know, my hiking plus the paragliding gear all in all, is probably like, uh, like over a little over 25 pounds. Okay, not not terrible. Yeah, like, not, like not almost terrible. like a backpacker. Yeah, exactly, like a backpacker. Except I'm a really uh, pretty short and skinny guy, so I weigh like less than 120 pounds. So I really feel uh, the weight. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and at altitude, it I mean every every step is a deep breath that you have to take. Right. So it takes me like, for example, if hiking with that pack versus for me hiking without my paragliding equipment, it takes me maybe. 40% uh, longer to make the hike up. Oh, wow. And and then you have to be prepared to, to hike back down again if the conditions aren't aren't right. How often has that does that happen for you? For me, it, 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 does, it doesn't happen often. It, it's only happened to me once. And then I've done six flights on, on the high volcanoes. Uh, so one, one out of seven, I, I had to hike back down. The, the reason for this is, that I, I really I really pick my days and in terms of the, the weather conditions and the wind. So if the day before the conditions don't look good, I, I just won't go and I save myself the trouble. And also, since these are all mountains that I've been on previously, I, I also have a, a pretty good idea of, of where I can take off from and I think it's at all possible or not. Um, so if I were going on, on, a, on a mountain that I've never been on before, uh, the ratio would be really different. And, or if I were going on a trip abroad somewhere where you have to commit to a weekend, 
or, or a certain date and, and, you know, hope for the best in terms of the weather, that would also be a really different ratio. So I try to take advantage of the fact that, that I have all these volcanoes really close to home and you can, you can really uh, take advantage of that. Man, those are such big mountains, man. It's so cool. Yeah. You know, we, we pride <laughs> ourselves on big mountains here in Colorado, but those just dwarf it. Like, like they dwarf because <laughs> our biggest mountains are only 14,000 feet. Every you've, you've been on a 20,000 footer doing this down in Peru and right next to your home is an 18, 18, five. That's just crazy. Yeah. Now, you don't think about Mexico city being such a high elevation mountainous city, but it's right there. Yeah. You wouldn't think so. And I mean, uh, a lot of people are surprised to see you. We, there's glaciers in, in Mexico, you know, not many. I mean, there's only three of them left, but uh, we're so a lot closer to the equator, but the mountains are so high that it's still pretty cold up there. Dang, that's so crazy. <laughs> so you said that uh, for most people, it's two days, two back or two nights and three days. How mm -hmm. in the world do you take a three day trip for most people and get it into the same day out your front door and back? That's a great question. So since uh, you know I have a full time job and, and a family, and I have a really limited vacation time, and I also want to uh, spend time at home. I started to uh, looking for ways to actually make these kinds of trips shorter, especially uh, trips abroad, like that trip uh, to Peru. And when, when I was doing the research on on altitude acclimatization, I found that some people were using like a, a hypoxic generator to to acclimatize at home. So it's the, the machine that you, you plug in, and it's about I don't know maybe like two and a half feet tall and probably the size of a, like a medium-sized uh, trash can that you have in the kitchen. And what that does, it's, it sucks, uh, it scrubs the oxygen or part of the oxygen from the air and substitutes nitrogen in its place. And then you hook that up to a, either a mask that, that you wear while you are at rest or exercising or to a, a little plastic tent uh, that you sleep in at night. It uh, simulates you know, the lack of oxygen that you will find at altitude. So yeah, which one do you do? Uh, when when I went to Peru, what I did is I, I got the the tent, and it's like a, it covers your body for like from your chest up, and I slept in that for for like six weeks um, before before going on the trip. And then I you gradually you gradually start to increase the simulated altitude that you sleep in. Or they use the pulse oximeter, so it's a little device like they have in the hospitals. You, you clip it onto your fingertip and it measures not only your your pulse or your, your heart rate, but also your blood oxygen saturation. So the how saturated your blood is with oxygen in, in, in terms of percentage. So in here in Mexico City, if I were at rest, my my blood oxygen would reading would probably be close to like 95, 96%. And if you're at sea level, it's like 98, 99%. And the, the higher up you go, the, the more it starts to drop. And when you sleep in, in the tent, if, in order to get the, your body to, you know, sufficiently stressed so that it has to adapt, you, you try to maintain it uh, below 90 and, and ideally uh, above 80. So you can actually get some rest at night as well. Yeah, because, I mean, does it affect your sleep? Yeah, it does a little bit. So you're, since you're not acclimatized yet, you're... There's less oxygen in the air, and, and your body has to compensate for that somehow. So your first thing that your your body does is it adjusts your breathing rate. So you'll be breathing in more air more air per minute uh, than normal, and then your your heart will start to 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 work over time also to compensate. So your resting heart rate at night it'll go up as well. So your heart will be working more during the whole night compared to what what the work that it would normally have to do so it it your your, your body has to has to work a little bit harder just just to to maintain that you know that that same or, or similar level of of oxygenation in in your blood so was it a hard decision to decide to buy one of those or was it like this is this is it this is what i need to turn to be able to do this and still maintain work and family and not take too much vacation time off yeah, for, for me, I think uh, um, maybe um, at first, I mean, I had my doubts because I hadn't tried it. In, in the U.S., there are probably some, you know, high tech, you know, training facilities where people might have access to, to one and, and try it out. But here, 
I really had to commit and, and buy one up front. There's some some mountaineering agencies that will actually rent it out to to their clients for certain expeditions. Oh wow! Um, but I had to buy it, and in in hindsight, I mean, it's been a it's been a great investment. I mean, it's it saved me uh, so much time, and I mean, at different points in in life, you know, if you want to live a, a life with some adventure in it, you're gonna need uh, time, and you're gonna need uh, you know money and resources and sometimes some lucky people will have both at the same time most probably won't <laughs> and you might have uh, one and, and not the other right? so you know if i had all the time in the world you know i would just go out and spend a couple weeks at, in, in, at altitude in peru or here and get fully acclimatized and and that's the most uh, effective thing you can do but if, if you don't have the time then you have to make up for it uh, in, in a different way and, and for me it's been really worth it. I mean, in Peru, what, what we did out there was usually like a two-week trip. Um, I, I went out there with a friend who lives in another city, which is lower in elevation. And he had to go out there a week before I did to, to get acclimatized. Um, so before before the big peak that we climbed, that's you know, close to 21,000 feet, he climbed another one that's around 17,000. So that that really helped him and he spent also uh, a couple of nights at uh, a little town in the middle of the the cordillera that's called Huaraz, which is which is also quite high it's like uh maybe 10 10,000 feet wow. uh, so that also helps and i was able to you know drop in a week after him and and go directly up to the base camp of the mountain and and follow the regular schedule from from then onwards you di- you didn't fly off that peak did you <laughs> uh, no, that that would have been great. Uh, well, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been possible because the weather w- turned really bad. By the time we were at the summit, we had you know it was a ping pong ball of weather. We couldn't see anything, just a few feet in front of us. So, and I mean that's that's the thing. If if I were if my plan had been to go out and 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 fly off the summit, I would have had to stay a lot longer to wait for a good weather window, or just hope to be really lucky. And and in that case, I would have had to carry my equipment all the way up and, and back down again because the, the weather was terrible Jeez. Um, and, and and then back then i hadn't started flying yet so that was that wasn't on, on the radar but uh, i would love to go back and, and and do something like that over there has anything ever gone wrong after getting in the air or calculations or, or did anything ever go close to going bad Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. Worried about mom or dad falling? The Symphony Medical Alert System from CVS Health helps make their home safer, even if you can't be there. Symphony works with voice activation or a care button they can opt to wear, along with smart sensors for coverage around the home. With 24-7 emergency response and an app to tie it all together, you can monitor your loved one's well-being for enhanced peace of mind. Terms and conditions apply. Learn more about Symphony at cvs.com slash symphony or find it at your nearest CVS Health Hub. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Uh, yeah, when I flew off of uh, Orizaba, the, the, the one that's uh, like 18,000 feet, 18,500, 18, the, the wind was stronger than, than what was forecasted the previous day. Uh, and then I saw the forecast change that the day I was uh, climbing up uh, so it was I was probably like at my very limit uh, in terms of how much wind I could handle on takeoff so I, I really thought twice about it and it took me a while to finally decide to to give it a shot I mean and everything turned out okay but when I once I was in the air gone up by myself so uh, my car was um at that you know at that the base camp and i had to get back to my car you know somehow and the wind was so strong that on my glider which is a, a beginner glider the beginner gliders don't aren't very good at f- flying upwind at the, penetrating the wind so if let's say there's something called the trim speed of the glider so that means you know how fast will it move uh, forwards at what speed if, if you're not touching anything you're just letting it fly by itself and and that might be like maybe close to a a little under 30 kilometers an hour. So if if the wind is 30 kilometers an hour and your trim speed is 30 kilometers an hour, and try to go upwind, you're just gonna slowly fall straight down to, with no forward speed. 
Um, so the when once I took off a little and I got a little away from the mountain, so I had you know plenty more more air below me and, and more space behind me in case something went wrong. But I, I realized I wasn't penetrating the wind at all. So in the air, I had to decide if I was going to turn away from the volcano. And I mean, I could have flowed down, but I, I would have had to look for a, you know, a, a field or somewhere to land uh, in a place I hadn't planned to land. And, and usually I, I try to go out and scout uh, possible landing fields uh, beforehand. So, so I know where I'm going and I know what, what options I have. So I don't have to make that decision on the spot. So that was one option. And then I would have run into the problem of having to find my car afterwards uh, somehow. <sighs> Um, so that's not yeah. very practical, <laughs> right? Right. And 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 the car was, I mean, at over thirteen thousand feet on the mountain, so it would have been a long way to to get back to it. Uh, and the other option was to try and, and land on volcano. So I hadn't planned on on landing on volcano, and and I had to land at about a little over two thousand feet below the summit. So uh, landing at at sixteen thousand feet is still pretty high. I landed on on the slope, and it was a uh, the landing was really easy in, because it was kind of a like like volcanic sand, so it was really soft. When there's wind, and if you land uh, into the wind, then the landing is really soft because the, the wind takes away all your speed or most of it. So it was a soft landing on a slope, but then I had to pack my glider in in a really uncomfortable place with a really really uh, steep incline uh, with sand everywhere and. And, and it's also still pretty high up, so every s- small effort uh, really is really tiring. And then after that, I had to carry all, all the equipment across the volcano and, and traverse to find, well, to get to the, the route uh, that I had climbed up to, so I could go back down and get back to the to my car. So that was uh, not, not a, really a hike and fly. It was like a hike and fly and then hike some more. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so it took me more, it took me longer to to fly down than than it would have taken to to just start uh, climbing back down after reaching the summit. Oh my god! Uh, because because of all of that, uh, but it was still uh, still quite quite an experience, and and nothing. I mean, I didn't injure myself and then damage even the equipment or anything. It all worked out. It was just a few like um, I mean, and that flight it was like two thousand more than two thousand feet of, of descent and and that took like a minute and a half wow. so really 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 fast like because the air is so thin everything happens a lot faster the, the glider flies faster and then your sink rate is is higher and if something happens to the wing like if you get a small collapse uh, or something that it also happens faster and you have to react quicker so everything everything went well it was just a little more time consuming and and, and, and tiring than than it would have been if there was zero wind and I would have made it back to to uh, the landing that I had planned, you know, right beside the car. So I'll have to go back there again and, and do a, a longer flight, you know, because uh, a minute and a half uh, <laughs> is, is, is really, really short, too short. <laughs> that is crazy. Yeah, there's uh, my, my partner in business, he paraglides and he tells me about it and there's so much to consider. It's, it's dangerous. It's... Uh, a lot of calculations. You have to be pretty smart to to put it all together and decide is this possible for you to do. You know. Yeah, it, it is for sure. I mean, if it's practiced safely and you have good proper instruction and you 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 make uh, decisions uh, in the, like the way you're taught to make them, it it can be really safe. People have been paragliding for a long time and never had accidents. You know, just like some people have been driving cars for you know decades and never had an accident and there are other right. people that get into accidents all the time <laughs> <laughs> right and and then it's, it's because people can get careless or go um, past their limits mm-hmm. um but but yeah i think uh, like yeah a lot of it is the planning and the theory behind it and the practice but there's also a component of of being able to to make uh, decisions on the spot, and sometimes you have to make those decisions by yourself. Like even if you, you have like a radio when you're learning and your, your instructor is coaching you, and you have his voice in your ear, but then you know eventually you start flying by yourself. And if you get into a situation, then you have to 
get yourself uh, out of it, right? You know, in the same way that happens in, in other sports, right? Like when I was rock climbing and I was climbing on, on a multi-pitch uh, uh, route and then uh, the rope got stuck when we were like a thousand feet up the walls and, and, and nobody can help you there either. To deal with the situation that, as it presents itself. So do you, do you know what the highest peak that's ever been hiked and flown? Hiked and flown? Yeah, uh, Everest. Really? Everest, yeah. Someone hiked up there and flew off the top? Yeah, a couple of people have actually. And oh and God. surprisingly, like the, the first... The first Paragolani flight from Everest was in in the in like the late eighties, quite a while ago. And and no in that way. back then, paragliding was very very new sport. And I mean the the gliders back then were were those gliders were dangerous back then. They they were a lot, lot less stable and they would be right. prone to collapsing. And and their their glide rate w- was not good. So they would they would I mean they would sink pretty fast. So it was harder landings and and at that altitude uh, harder still um so it was an amazing feat for for the time and and since then other people have, have, have flown from the summit that's another level and then there's people doing um i mean if anyone wants to look into this uh, i think it's fascinating there's uh, some two french pilots uh, antoine Girard and 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 damien lacaz they were recently in Pakistan in, in, in the Karakoram, like the, the Himalaya, and they did a, a like a cross country traverse. So multiple days flying, you know, uh, many miles each day uh, in in the mountain range. They, they flew really close to, you know, to to a couple of the eight thousand meter peaks up there, and then the idea was to land on on a seven thousand meter mountain. It's called Spantic. Uh, so they landed on the mountain face at like 6,000 meters. Uh, and the idea was to do a, a, a summit attempt after landing and then, then uh, fly off again. And they got pretty close to the summit, but then they had uh, problems with the altitude. Uh, um, and, and Antoine had started to get symptoms of a cerebral edema. So they turned around and went back down and, and they flew off the next day. But I think they... Uh, under different circumstances, you know, with good weather and with without that uh, incident with the altitude sickness, they would have been able to summit and, and then fly off again. It's like a regular expedition would have taken a couple of weeks just to reach, you know, the initial spot where they landed on the mountain. Wow. So that that's that's like uh, the cutting edge of uh, um, you know what's possible with a piece of fabric and, and some mountaineering equipment. <laughs> so for you, what's What's that dream goal? What what are you hoping to? What you want? What's the biggest thing on your bucket list with with this sport? Um, so for now, I'm like uh, my second flight on on Ista. Uh, instead of just flying straight down, I uh, like the first flight. It lasted like twelve minutes. Really emotional, exciting flight, uh, and everything went well. And after that, I I was you know I I'd already learned how to you know use uh, thermals to, to stay up in the air longer. I had, at the time, I hadn't, you know, really done any big cross-country flights or anything like that. But but I could thermal uh, well enough, so I tried to go uh, out back out there again on a day where I, I thought I was going to be able to to find some thermals, and, and sure enough, I, I I did, and I was able to fly, you know, for an hour uh, above uh, above the volcano. So it was incredible to just. What an experience. Uh, fly over the the whole route that that i had just uh hiked up a couple hours before then it took me five hours to go up and then in in a couple minutes i i flew over the entire route and that was uh, a beautiful beautiful experience for me so i want to i want to do more of those slides here because uh, i don't think anybody had ever done that before on, on that mountain and then the other mountains where i, I just barely probably did the first descent then and i want to not just uh, fly down but you know uh, enjoy the the views a little longer and, and fly over the mountains uh there's i mean in in europe and other places where this is more common people also they do what, what they call top landing so you can you know take off from somewhere lower and then and then land on the summit uh, with with the paraglider so kind of like climbing it with with the paraglider instead of hiking up uh, I don't think anyone's ever done that 
on these mountains here. So that's something that would be really cool to do as well. And and then mixing, like the next level for me would, would be uh, mixing the cross country flying with with hike and fly and then going on a on a trip, uh, like a multi day trip where you 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 fly and hike and 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 actually cover some some good distance. And, and that's what I want to work up to. So that that's something that's called uh, Volbiv. I already had like Nick Nick Nainans on the show, and he it's that's he he's done a lot of that. Um, and, and and that's that's something I aspire to do as well. So crazy. Well, congratulations on you know learning how to do this pretty quickly, accelerating in the sport, accelerating the sport in your area, and uh, I hope you do some firsts like never never been done. Uh, from mountain to mountain that would just you could circle the whole city man that's just yeah. crazy that's so awesome how can people <laughs> keep in touch with you and, and follow your trips and what you do sure uh, um, I'm on Instagram as uh, well it, it's in Spanish so I'll spell it out it's called uh, Poncho El Piloto like Poncho the Pilot so it's P-O-N-C-H-E-L and and then pilot with an O in the end, P-I-L-O-T-O, Poncho El Piloto on Instagram. Perfect. Well, we'll link that in the show notes uh, when we release it. But, man, what an interesting sport. What an interesting thing to get into. It is. And the fact that you're doing so much to make it to where you can do it in a third of the time that it takes other people, that is uh, – that's dedication, and that's what it takes when times of life, like you have a newborn, you have a family, you have responsibilities. It might not be like this forever, but like for now, you love the sport enough yeah. that you're going to chase it by doing what you have to do to still get out there and, and maintain that, that stoke. Yeah, have, having limited resources is, is a great motivation to, to get creative. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, if you were rich sitting on top of one of the mountains and – and uh, with all the time in the world, man, you probably wouldn't do anything. You probably just sit there. <laughs> exactly. We need a we need a little bit of pressure and, and those kinds of incentives sometimes. But yeah, I think it's great that a sport like this. And sometimes, you know, we think that uh, we think that everything's already been done. You know, and, and you know, a lot of things have been done. But I mean, I'm sure that if people like look around the where the, their their hometown or the places they frequently visit and. Um, for sure, there's a lot of things that that, that could be firsts in, in some way, and it doesn't have to be a first for the whole world. But but if it's a first for you, that's it's the same uh, level of excitement and, and accomplishment too. Absolutely, man. I, I tell people it's a lot like it's like songs. You know, you, you you'd think with all the songs that are out in the all of history, every good song's ever been written already. <laughs> but good ones come out every day, man. Like good music yeah. comes out every single day. There's there's some first out there that would, yeah. that you would be stoked to, to chase, and it's not even on even in anybody's radar yet. So for sure, keep it up, man. You're definitely one of those people that are that are making that happen. That's so cool. Well, thanks, man. Making good music, I like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there'll never be an end to good songs. There'll never be an end to what you can do first, something adventurous. So, Adrian, thanks for joining us. Uh, my pleasure, Mason. It's great talking. Yeah, and uh, keep us updated on what you do next. We'll post uh, your Instagram. And, uh, yeah, man, congratulations again on being a father. Maybe one day you'll take your little girl up there with you. Oh, uh, for sure. That's got to be in the plans. And, and congratulations ahead of time to you, too. And keep doing what you're doing with, with this podcast and getting people to share their stories. Uh, I'll be listening, too. Awesome. All right. Have a good one, man. You, too. Bye-bye. All right. See ya. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.
Tired of lying awake, tossing and turning, just hoping for a few hours of sleep? Get the sleep you crave with the one-of-a-kind Tempur-Pedic. Only Tempur-Pedic uses proprietary temper material that continuously adapts and responds to your body to relieve pressure, so you get deep, uninterrupted sleep. All night, every night. The Tempur-Pedic Summer of Sleep starts now with all Tempur-Pedic mattresses on sale and savings up to $500 on adjustable sets. Learn more at TempurPedic.com. At Capella University, you're in control of your education. With the game-changing FlexPath format, you can set your own deadlines and move at your own pace. The faster you move, the more you save. Visit capella.edu to learn more.